Miracy. So I've been studying adult education and distance learning, you know, in a military and professional setting for well over 20 years. And I am astonished by just how powerful the distance learning can be if you know how to structure it and you allow people to explore that space in a safe way. Hello, and welcome to Course Lab, the show that teaches creators like you how to make better online courses. I'm Danny Eaney, the founder and CEO of Miracy, and I'm here with my co-host, Abe Crystal, the co-founder of Rizuku. Hey there, Danny. In each episode of Course Lab, we showcase a course and creator who is doing something really interesting, either with the architecture of their course or the business model behind it, or both. Today's guest is Ken Long. Ken is the owner of Tortoise Capital Management, as well as the host of the Daily Strategy Training Podcast. Ken, welcome. Well, it's great to be here and wonderful to meet you both. Awesome. So Ken, tell us who you are. Tell us what you do. Tell us how you came to be doing it. Well, by way of background, I just turned 65. I've been a soldier in the U.S. Army for 45 years in various forms, and I've been an educator for most of that time. While also serving as a soldier, I developed some skills in managing our family income and trading portfolio, and I took some courses on how to do that. And the trainer was impressed with my work, and we ended up going into business together to provide trading solutions to investment professionals around the world for the last 30 years. When COVID came along and the, I would say, the emergence of distance learning as a phenomenon, I tried doing the same things online and found that I just had to come up with some new skills, that the way I packaged material, the way I presented it, the way I prepared the audience for the material I was delivering had to go through some significant changes. The pacing's different. You can't feel if they're getting it. You can't get that body language in a satisfying way. You have to build in more checks on learning and more opportunities for them to participate. You know, in the classroom, if you're on a roll, you can just see that they're getting it and they're nodding their heads. But that doesn't really work that well online. And so you have to come up with some adaptations to account for just the different setting. At the same time, it's not unusual now to have people from many different time zones. And you have to now take that into account where they are in their day or their night and what their cultures might be and their comfort level and their technology level. So there's a whole new set of variables that you have to contend with. And, you know, without guidance, it's like walking in the dark trying to find the light switch, you know. What sort of adaptations um, have you implemented to address some of these challenges? Well, I've started to realize that the courses that I teach and the education that's going on is not just synchronous, where we're talking back and forth live, but you have to consider the preparation phase, the during phase, and the after phase. And you have to account for where they are in the prep. There may be some things that you can do to prime the pump, some checks on learning that help you establish a baseline and that we're ready to teach in the room. Inside the room, you have to build in time for them to talk, to demonstrate mastery, to use whiteboards, to give them the microphone, to let them co-create some of that experience uh, while you're doing it. And then afterwards, you have to follow up in, I think, more structured ways than you might in a live setting. In live setting, you can talk at the coffee machine or at the water cooler in the hallway, or you can linger after the class. And that's not always easy to do in an online setting. So you have to build in follow-ups that will allow you to check in with them, to give them a chance to get back with you before the next session. So I think that the classroom education really has to expand to before, during, and after, which to me is one of the features of hybrid workshop that you guys are teaching. I think you do a great job helping us with pre and post uh, preparation. And um, so those are some of the things. I I would also say uh, I emphasize more artifacts now, the short written materials or mind maps or files that we can share as a way to lock in the learning that's going on in the classroom. And I've discovered that student-generated artifacts have become a really important part of the way that we learn together by giving them more freedom to co-create, we've actually become much more effective in this distributed hybrid format. Can you just expand on that and and talk through more of what are 
both what's working well for you in terms of what you describe as a distributed hybrid format. What does that look like? What's working well? And then what are the challenges you've had to overcome in, in terms of serving your students and getting to where you are today? Well, what I've learned is that um, I have to speak less in the classroom and let them shape the classroom more. So what I've developed in the last year or so is more of a menu style approach to the things that I'm competent to teach on, whether it's creativity or critical thinking or specific trading techniques that we use every day in the market. And I give them tools now to help self-assess where they think they are in the array of skills. And using that kind of pre-assessment, we can then use that menu and actually build specific courses that adapt more to what their needs are. In the past, I would have just said, look, 30 people show up and their baselines are so different that you end up teaching sometimes to the lowest common denominator. And so not everybody gets everything they wanted. What I've actually found is that when you incorporate students in the preparation phase for the actual design of the course and having them specify what it is that they need, then you can actually tailor the delivery. You may be able to leverage some other artifacts that you've built from other courses, but you need a way to start integrating some of those pieces and parts into a pleasing offering to the students. I guess, so it totally makes sense in terms of the overall framework and so on. You know, for people listening who are looking for ways to kind of put this in practice, right, or make the hybrid format actionable for their own courses, do you have any, you know, kind of tips, tricks, examples of what are some things that other course creators could do to be more effective in engaging their own students? Well, I think you have to budget time for some of the social connectivity. You still have to have a human-to-human contact, even if you're teaching at a distance through the web. And you have to look at the ways that we can create feelings of community in the way that we are collaborating together. You have to find techniques that allow us to collaborate more. So instead of, let's say, one four-hour chunk of a lesson that I might used to have done a four-hour lesson on a Saturday, uh, it's really better to look at how you spread that out and pace it, maybe a half an hour here, an hour there, with a little bit of social commentary. Maybe it's in Zoom, maybe it's inside the web conferencing in Rizuku. But you need to build in time to allow the human factors to come through. Humans are pretty adaptive, and we do find ways to create community in however we engage. And you need to pay attention to that social environment so that people feel like they're talking with another human. What are some of the ways in which you've seen that social self-organization happen? Well, the best example that I can think of that happened to me just earlier this week. And uh, I had been recommending to a team of folks that I was teaching that I thought accountability partnering would be very powerful and to develop small, smaller groups of two or three or four to be able to work through some of the material that came up in a more informal setting and without me being there. And to my surprise, they actually tried that. And I found out some folks had been doing that for a couple months. And uh, one of the in-class assignments for them to do was to figure out how to run that kind of accountability and partnering session on their own. So they put together some interview questions, they recorded the session, they had some back and forth, and it was rich and robust, and it was better than anything I was giving them, if I'm going to be completely honest. I like to think I helped set conditions, but the fact that they were able to work as peers together and then create an artifact with a video, it was so inspiring to other people to see how the students had become the teachers in that sense, that they had, they had formed their own natural groups and they learned together in a really powerful way. And, uh, and it was a surprise to them at the end of it. They said, wow, we can't believe 90 minutes went by. Well, when you start encouraging people to become co-creators and they start getting some agency or some authority to shape their learning environment, they go to places that they need to go and they work with fellow students. And I will tell you, as a teacher for 30 years, when you learn to trust the students to do that, boy, it really unleashes the power of the team to learn together. I have become as much a student of what they are teaching as they are a student of mine. That's a really attractive proposition, I think, to a lot of course creators that, you know, if you just create a space, your students will, you know, essentially self-organize and find these systems and structures that work. I think it's also a very scary proposition because it's like, well, what if they don't? What if it goes wrong? 
How would you advise someone who's thinking, that sounds really great, I'm just really worried about it going wrong? What kind of student groups would be well-suited for being given that sort of responsibility and challenge versus which wouldn't? What sort of facilitation would help to make it happen? Yeah. Well, the demographic that I teach professionally, the professional traders, they're wrapped pretty tightly and they really want value. And they know how to manage risk. And so you have to start in small bites and you have to take away all the risk. And part of that is I've got a lot of traditional material that's well-tested and very satisfying. And so what I offer these guys is, look, I want you to try on this pilot course with me where we start shaping this stuff together, where you take the reins a little bit and you start shaping this and then call on me to help support you and rely on the team. And we're going to grow and learn together. And there's no risk to you. I'm taking all the risk. And then if you think the time is not worth it, you can always opt out. And I'm going to offer you some of these, you know, parting gifts for going to the trouble of taking a risk with us together. But the potential for reward of learning in new ways, they begin to get it right away. Because in the world of trading and financial markets, trying to find a unique perspective is where value is really coming from. It really triggers our creativity. And it lets you meet your objectives in the world. So these guys are willing to take on some of those ventures if I can show them that we've taken away the risk. And then what you do is you reward the folks who were brave enough to try it on, and then you give them more benefits than they expected. Always over-deliver. And so you might give them the next version of the course, or you might bring them back as a teaching assistant, or you might give them one of your other courses. And that way you start building trust and confidence that you're going to over-deliver. So I really think that um, finding people that are willing to take that risk and then calm their fears a little bit, you're going to find a way to go. I would tell you that the guy who was most worried about that was me. The students were willing to trust me and to test pilot these things, but I'd been conditioned by about 30 years of delivering high quality stuff that I was very confident in as an instructor, that I could send good material to them. And I was, I was terrified of under delivering. I did not want them to be unsatisfied. And so I had to learn to trust their feedback more. And they said, hey, no, this is really what we like. And I had to learn it, even though it felt a little uncomfortable to me. Once I could learn to trust my students a little bit more, that it made each next step easier to go. Anything that you've learned from, like you're, you're teaching a pretty tactical topic, right? In terms of trading and finance, it's more tactical than say a course on, you know, discovering your life's purpose or personal development topic. Just curious if there have been lessons learned from working in that more specialized tactical arena that might be helpful to other teachers. Well, it certainly is. There's uh, really technical requirements to understand financial markets. I mean, these are professional traders that you're contending with. But I would say there's a lot of technical elements in teaching military officers how to conduct their operations. So there's the consequences of failure in both of those arenas are severe. So there's certainly technical knowledge. But one of the things that we've been able to demonstrate is that the human factors that go into technical performance, there's always a human that's performing that skill. And that's a human that has emotions and an ego and uncertainties and a background and um, has to learn to collaborate and contend with fear and doubt. And so a lot of the most powerful stuff that we've done lately is addressing some of those foundational and root, I would call it like soft skills, you know, in the unconscious or the semi-conscious or the emotional intelligence. It turns out that those are absolutely essential for developing resiliency and courage and teamwork in the world. And the hybrid approach where you're doing distance learning in many ways, it's almost easier to do it in the hybrid format, and you wouldn't think that was the case. We use a technique called true storytelling that my doctoral mentor developed, David Boji, and he teaches ways of doing true storytelling that leverages indigenous ways of knowing and emotional truth-telling. And we have actually found that the separation that you get in physical space allows us to feel a little more in control of what we present to new people, to strangers, that I can more carefully control how much of myself I want to reveal until I feel that we are building some collaboration in there. And we've actually found that this hybrid style 
creates incredible bonds across time and space in ways that we were not prepared to see. In fact, when I combine that kind of true storytelling and the emotional intelligence along with technical trading, we're hitting home runs with the intersection of those two skills. So I've been studying adult education and distance learning in a military and professional setting for well over 20 years. And I am astonished by just how powerful the distance learning can be if you know how to structure it and you allow people to explore that space in a safe way. That was fascinating. Ken, thank you so much for sharing all that. Ken Long is the owner of Tortoise Capital Management and host of the Daily Trading Strategy podcast. To find out more about him and all the courses he's offering right now, head on over to tortoisecapital.net. That's tortoisecapital.net. Now stick around for my favorite part of the show, where Abe and I will pull out the best takeaways for you to apply to your course. Abe, uh, there was so much here. What jumped out to you? I mean, I guess the first theme perhaps is not so much a, a tactic, but it's just Ken's optimism and the energy that he brings to his courses and how he works with his students. It's not so much, you know, what we normally talk about, which is more strategies and approaches, but I think it's probably a big part of his success is he just has this tremendous positive energy about every aspect of his courses that he talks about, about how you know excited he is to see his students making progress. And I can't help but think that that's a big part of his model and why it's working is just the energy and the approach that he brings, you know, in addition to like specific approaches. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly very experienced and very skilled as a teacher, as an educator, as a facilitator. And he's working on very complex subject matter with very serious students, very serious people going through his programs. But what stuck out to me kind of throughout the entire conversation was that he has really internalized the idea of co-creation with the student and everything that that entails, you know, letting them lead in terms of what they're looking for and you being adaptive to them and getting comfortable in that place of ambiguity and all the benefits that it brings to you and to them and to the program. Um, he really got that in a way that a lot of people often don't, or they try to shortcut, or they try to like, you know, I'll do a little bit of it, but then I'll come back to, you know, being the guy who knows it all. And it was very refreshing and inspiring to see just how far he's taken it. Yeah, co-creation and a willingness to do things on the fly, right, or being very dynamic and adaptable. I think something that many course creators still struggle with is this shadow of perfectionism or the idea that you have to design out this perfect course in advance and get every detail set and then your students go through it. But we know that that's almost never possible. And many of the best courses come about because they're going through iteration and improvement over time. It can, I guess, feel scary to do that in the moment. But Ken's experience shows how valuable that can be if you're willing to listen to it and adapt to your participants. You can improve so much faster than if you're thinking of a course as this finished product that has to be delivered. Absolutely. That's, I mean, yeah, there was so much in the conversation, but like for everything else, we'd have to just rehash the whole conversation. So I think we can go to the read up. All right. Thank you for listening to Course Lab. I'm Abe Crystal, co-founder and CEO of Riziku, here with Danny Eaney, founder and CEO of Miracy. Course Lab is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Just Between Coaches and Making It. This episode of Course Lab was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Jeff Govertson assembled the episode. Danny Eaney is our executive producer, post-production by Post Office Sound. Another thanks to Ken for sharing his program with us today. And you can learn all about him over at his site, tortoisecapital.net. To make sure you don't miss the excellent episodes coming up on Course Lab, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you enjoyed the show, please go ahead and leave us a starred review. It really does make a difference. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. I'm not hearing Ken. Uh, testing one, two. That's not good. <laughs> oh, gosh. Now I don't think... Ken, can you hear Danny? Uh, 
No, I hear you, but not I can't, Dan. I can't hear Ken now. Oh, there you are. I can. Okay. Over.